Bring it in, please. Ned Dorman, are you here? Ned Dorman, are you here? I have noticed each morning I got an idea. less and less people here. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a steep observation. Save me words. You know, it's just, uh, uh, Ken, uh, how are you? Wow. Got some old rackets there. Let's take a look at that. What's the? Can, can we see the rackets up in the camera? This will be a little bit different. Going to church. Who's? Okay, guys. Uh, we got Brian and Dickie gonna uh, give a little clinic, and they're gonna do a little bit of history as well. So uh, I'll turn it over to Brian and Dick. Dick Stockton. Good morning. Good morning. I asked I, when we came out. I just asked George to just because he tapes everything for some stupid reason. I don't know why. I just asked him, go just tip, play whatever it is we said last year because we're just and we, every year we say the same thing out here. Clinic number twenty-two. All right, <laughs> play the tape, please. Play the tape. We're, we're gonna we're gonna do a little different uh, this morning. We're gonna talk about uh, evolution of uh, equipment and. Uh, you mean rackets, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Rocky. Oh, there's always one. <laughs> Some, somebody who comes out in an outfit like that, how can they even uh, open their mouth? Uh, I, I just don't get it. <laughs> Zing! <laughs> it looks like a Steeler. No, he's good, it's good because next year Steve's going to do a women's uh, fantasy <laughs> camp and, and uh, Numbnuts over here will be ready. <laughs> 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 Okay, so here we go. Brian's Brian's actually got some equipment, and, and who who is it <clears throat> that had a uh, Wilson Advantage racket for me to sign the other day? Yeah. Oh, I, I, no? I have an advantage. You have one. I, I do too. But I, someone actually brought one here. That's me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, cool. That was a great racket. It was. Yeah, that one with you? I, I think they sold two of them. That one. <laughs> <laughs> well. Yeah, so we thought we'd do something a little bit different, like Dickie said, and talk about more, more discuss the evolution of rackets, because most of you are a lot older than us, so you have a lot more, a lot more history and probably know a lot better. But, uh, you know, just thinking back to when we started, we started with something like this, wooden racket, single shaft, usually strung with gut because you didn't get much life out of the racket, so you needed life out of the strings. Um, so I started with a, um, with a Kramer Pro uh, with a Kramer Autograph. You started with a, also Kramer? I did. What and was the tension the strings in there? What was the tension? Tension was about 62. 62 was pretty, uh, pretty normal, which, yeah. was pretty, which was tight. 62 mm -hmm. was tight. tight. Yeah. And you notice, obviously, the, the first thing that strikes you from nowadays to, <coughs> to that. Mm. The size of the head, mm. and it almost looks like a badminton racket now. Well, yeah, that, that's like that's squash. that's this is today's squash racket. <laughs> you think about it. Do they do oversized in squash? Yeah, they've gotten bigger than they were, but this is pretty good. Yeah. And so the size of the head will be the first thing that you look at, but also if you feel it, the grips are going to be generally bigger. We had to play with bigger rackets, um, and also heavier because the game was was played. Uh, game was taught more with whole body rotation and trunk rotation and trunk use to get all the power because you couldn't swing this racket fast enough because it had to be heavy enough um, to have some mass behind it if you got too light it was too flexible in the head you didn't get enough on the ball so you had to have a heavy racket so therefore you had to use your whole body to create pace whereas nowadays it's gone lighter racket head speed how fast can you generate your Asking your arm move to create speed. You talk about the weight of rackets. Um, uh, this is probably, I don't know, my, my, my wood racket, the Kramer, was 13 and 3 quarter ounces. This is probably about the same. But if you ask Roy and or Fred what they played with, you will not believe. 15 ounces. 15 to 16 ounce bats. Uh, wow. 
we, we went to school. We had a guy on our team named Bobby McKinley, whose brother was Wimbledon champ. Actually, uh, beat Fred in the final in '63, and he was a little guy. He was about five foot seven, maybe. He played with a five-inch grip. Five-inch. This is about four and five A's. No company even makes a four and three quarter anymore. Now there's talk that they're going to maybe even do away with five A's. You can't get this racket from Wilson in a five A's. Yeah, they don't make them. Nobody, nobody plays with anything that size. Right. I think Federer and Nadal play with a four and a quarter, or something like that. I mean, it's yeah. unbelievable. So it's all about generating racket head speed and how quickly can you move your arm. And obviously with a lighter racket, you can do that quicker. The downside of that is with a lighter racket, you're swinging harder and uh, injuries can, can creep in. Where, where you know, they the, might the not baseball have... bats also have gotten much lighter. Lighter? I picked up some of the bats that, that people uh, used in the old days. It's amazing. Babe Ruth bat, so on, so the change in baseball as well. Well, the, the, the weight of the racket is, 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 is an amazing, the differences, because they've gone, they went from this down to almost eight ounces. And, and, and I don't know if you, know, you realize it, but when the rackets were that light, that's why everybody has tennis elbow. In the old days, very few people ever developed, developed tennis elbow. Now there's no, there's no mass in the racket. This racket is a piece of lumber, it really is, and it absorbs a lot of the shock. At, at that weight that today's rack but now they're actually starting to go back up a little bit you know, you know it's 10 ounces 10 to 11 is pretty average can you go back to grip size for a second what's your relationship to grip size to anything why it's bit smaller versus bigger well, i think it's just a it's a comfort thing more than anything else and obviously the size of your hand but i'm sure federer has a hand at least as as large as mine, so why is it and I still play with a four and five A's, and he plays with a four and a five. You get used to it. Yeah, and, and they have you the ability. You know, Federer uses his wrist a lot. You know, he's not. He's not a. He's got classic looking strokes, but it's not classic in the way we played. And we never used use our wrist at all. He does, and with a small grip, you know, he can flick it around very nicely. You know, but uh, I mean, it's really it's it's up and down with technology. It's unbelievable. You. You get comfortable with something, a racket, and six months later, it's out of production. And the shoes, it's the same thing, which is probably the most important piece of equipment we have, if you really think about it. Because if your feet are bad, you can't play this game. You can get through with any other injury, probably, and find a way to play, unless you have bad feet. You have no chance. And you get used to a pair of shoes, and six months later, you can't find them. Somebody, oh, it was Rob. Where's Rob? Rob Delman. Yeah, right here. <laughs> Tell your story about rackets, please, for a minute. About the purchasing. Uh, Didn't you, it wasn't you that you told me that you bought, you found a racket and you bought 10 of them because they don't make them anymore. Yeah, it was the Wilson Pro Open. Yeah. I bought them on eBay. Yeah. I bought them from Tennis Warehouse. Yeah. A lot of people out. will do that. They, get, they find a racket they like and they, yeah. you better buy a bunch of them because it's not going to be around for long. Question I can't get, can't get an answer from from anybody is how long should a racket last? One of today's rackets. Do they go dead? Yeah. How long do they go dead? It really depends on how much you're playing. Say you play three, four, five times a week. How much do you leave it in your car, in your trunk? You know, it really depends how you take care of it. I mean, I've played with. I've just switched to this model racket, which is about three or four years old. I was playing with a black blade, the, the first blade that came out. And, and those rackets are still in good shape. If I replace the grommet strips, the head the things up here, I can keep playing with them. And they're four years old. You know, because sometimes I, I take them out of my car and I bring them into the house overnight. And so the heat is a problem? The heat's a problem, yeah. <clears throat> Big, problem. Problem. Yeah. Big problem. Big problem. You can't, don't leave them. You know, racket bags are good, and one side of them is usually insulated, one pocket. That's where your rackets are supposed to be. Because they that protects it from heat and cold. You know, we never used to check. I never used to check my rack, and I still don't. In an airplane, because they end up in the in the mm. in the baggage hold, it's freezing in there. Mm. That's not good for you. It's not good for the strings, for sure. What about poly poly strings? So they really don't break, uh, but they go dead. I guess after a while. Yeah, they get soft after a while, and you're stringing, restringing because they get soft. You've, they've lost the tension pretty quickly too. And if you're a top player on tour that can afford to restring them every night, yeah. you're in pretty good shape. But if you're like the rest of us, you know, you want to save them as much as possible. I try to play with a, 
with uh, the Wilson NXT, which keeps its tension. Yeah. It's a multi-filament string. It keeps its tension a little bit longer. So you don't play with a poly? Right? No, no. I played with the poly when I first, when I went from this racket to this racket. This was so lively, I couldn't couldn't control the ball. So when I, I was working with, <coughs> traveling with Warren Bosworth at the time, yeah. many of you probably have heard of him. Um, and we first strung this up with poly. This was in uh, about 83. And it was really helpful to to allow me to adjust. It was a little bit deader than <coughs> gut, um, but now I'm playing with a, this poly, and it's just I really don't like it because it's it's deader off center. And when I'm balling, I'm a whole lot more off center than I used to be. <laughs> so so I need a little bit more forgiveness, and I'm just not getting it with. It. So if I hit it in the center, it feels okay, but just a little bit off, it just doesn't have the life. So you know, I think. Again, it's going to be a matter of preference, and I think the poly helps, certainly helps get more spin. Um, everybody's using it these days, so there's, there's there's something to it, you know. Uh, a lot of them are using a hybrid because they still want a little bit of life, um, but but blended with with the additional spin that they're able to get. Which string, which way? Um, Both well, ways. Victor Imperial. They do both ways, just yeah. whatever they get hurt. Yeah, I think you know if you're having trouble with breakage, I think you'd want to go poly in the mains and uh, it's natural or, or NXT in the crosses. That's going to help uh, make it last a little bit longer. I think if you're looking for a little bit more feel, I think you might go the other way. You get because you've got a longer, you got longer strings that are. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a funny story about stringing. My my wife teaches uh, in where we live, and a, a lot of her clients are the women's teams and the older their older players. And and uh, this she brought a racket home one day. You have perfect strings in it. I said, what's the deal with this racket? She said, uh, one of my clients wants you to restring it. I said, what's wrong with it? She said, I don't know. She says she said this is a quote. She, Put, it, put in the strings that are going to ma make me be able to hit topspin. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I said, what? I said, she said to me, she said, that's what she said. <laughs> I said, well, I'd like to find those too. <laughs> so I cut the strings out and I put in a new set of Wilson NXT 17 because that's all I had to put in there. And she took her the racket and then she came back the next day and I said, what'd she say? She said, this is the greatest ever. <laughs> 50 bucks for that string job. But I hope that wasn't my sister. <laughs> Forgot. Sorry. It's interesting to talk about the strings because in um, in 77, at the end of 77, there was a couple things that happened. As the racket started to change, so did string technology. And there was a guy from Germany, Mr. Fisher, who created this thing called a spaghetti strong racket. Oh, yeah. That many remember. I've got one at home. I'm going to try to bring it next year. So that'll be our next year. <laughs> it was outlawed, but um, yeah. it was it wasn't outlawed for a year. You know, Michael Fishback beat Stan Smith that year in the U.S. Open. Um, and then Stasi the ended Vilas' streak in France at the end of the year with the spaghetti racket. Vilas walked off the court. So, um, Brian, what did those strings do that gave such an advantage? Yeah. Well, there were there were two strings in every hole, and they were connected together. So you had two planes working. And they were connected together, so so they were moving separately. <coughs> so as you'd hit the ball, you'd create uh, <coughs> what what does that? Uh, what, do you, you, you understand what? Friction. Okay. Something like that. Okay, thanks. <laughs> but anyway, that's that's what you, the theory of it was. Could you play with that wooden racket now? <coughs> yes, could you, you could. It's it's actually it's kind of fun to 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 come out and. and Maybe we ought to do that. Maybe rally. maybe you guys can rally a few. We just, we just play for about a half an hour. After that, it loses. <laughs> I had. I, I, I usually fun. have. The reason this is in my bag. I usually have this in my bag all the time because I use it as a teaching aid for kids, primarily with the volley. It helps them go through the volley a little bit more because you can, you have to be very sure of your stroke. You've got to punch through the ball. You can't just just uh, flick or even on the groundies. You can't you can't roll the ball. I mean, you can't have a heavy flick with the, with uh, any of your shots you really got to go through it so if you're working on that with a young player it's helpful I gave it to a girl the other day a young girl she loved it and I, I was surprised I, I would say here try
try this because we were we had a discussion uh, about what's more important in the racket, the strings or the racket. So she was an 11-year-old girl. This is the funniest little discussion we were having. She she was convinced the strings were 51% more important. <laughs> so I said, so I, I had a set of string in my bag and I threw her the string. I said, okay, if you think the strings are more important, go out and hit with that. Uh, just a set of string. She went, no, it has to be in the racket. Yeah, 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 yeah. I said, okay, so here, take this. Go out and hit with that. See what you think. She loved it. She couldn't put it down. Wow. So, um, you know, if you're, if you're clean, if you're hitting the ball in the center of the racket, uh, wood seems great. But so what if your first miss hit, hit, then you, is you the reason the why you go what back to <laughs> spaghetti yeah. strings do to the ball when you hit it. Uh, just a, a, it, it's, a it's lot of spin. 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 Weird. Known spin. Just it's like uh, playing ping pong with uh, foam yeah. versus a sandpaper paddle. And the spin you get on it is incredible. Yeah. But but anyway, to finish that story, the end of the year. So we got through the year, and, and the ITF had to decide what to do with the spaghetti rack at the end of 77. And nobody knew what was going to happen. So I got one strong. Barry Phillips Moore, an old Australian that friends with most of these guys, uh, had one strong for me. And I've had it. It's been strong since 77. Wow. And I've got it. I'm going to try to bring it next year. Yeah. But it's... It, but it was finally outlawed, and um, so now it's sitting in my in a box. Hey, Dan, I have a curiosity. Every time I read about these rackets where they put computer chips in it, uh, do you think you pick up any valuable information by having a chip in the? Uh, the yeah, racket? you get you. You're able to get the weather forecast. <laughs> <laughs> The distance to the hole. No. <laughs> I don't. I don't. I don't know that they sell. That they sell very well, to be honest. I mean, yeah. I, so I mean, it's like Wilson. Uh, Prince came out with a $500 boron racket about 35, 40 years ago. In fact, Newt played with it for a while, and it sounds great. But you know, they only sold one, and, and they discontinued that. You know, tennis players, as you know. Are generally pretty cheap. <laughs> Golfers will spend money on anything. You are not cheap. You are not cheap. Thank you, Your wife thanks you. I will withhold his paycheck for that comment. You can. You're not paying him. What paycheck? I haven't been. You only get paid when you've been here 30 years. That's a good question. I mean, I, uh, I think Bob Watt came out with a, 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 a chip in the racket within the last couple of years. I, you know, I've never, been, you know, I haven't seen it. I haven't tried it. I don't know. So, Sony has discontinued its chip. What's that? Sony's not selling it anymore. Uh, hmm. Either there's no demand or. Yeah, I don't think there's much there's of a demand. Issue. Yeah, you know, the, the rackets are today. You know, everybody said, "Well, should I get this racket or that racket?" There's not much difference in the in the rackets anymore. The, the 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 poor equipment companies have been weeded out. Most of the rackets, are, they're all made in China, aren't they, Steve? Is there anybody that makes one? John, uh, where's John? John, will have the answer to that. The four factories in China make all the rackets. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So, which is interesting, going back, there were only a few companies that made rackets in our day. Dunlop Schlesinger, yeah. right? Wilson. Um, Wilson, and a couple companies in Belgium, Snowart and Donne, yeah. made rackets and marketed them to Spalding and, yeah. and many others. Banker? Banker, who made Bancroft? They didn't make their own. Um, they made by Wilson? No, they actually had their own factory. They did, they made them out of uh, bamboo. Bamboo, yeah. The, the, player special. Yeah, you had to be careful because if you left it lying around, it would grow. <laughs> <laughs> Very dangerous. <laughs> Listen, you, gotta, you gotta understand all this stuff, guys. You yeah, have yeah. to. Hey, Dick. You brought a, you brought a mm -hmm. about the chip in the rack and, and, and uh, I think Marty said something about the, the Sony sensor. The questions that I always brought up with, from that standpoint is, you got that information, what did you do with it? And I think what happened, so many people tried to figure out if they could get more spin on the ball, more power on the ball, so they, they wreck your elbows to hit the fence more often. And so I think that it, to, for a teaching pro to be able to use that in a lesson, 
was very invaluable because the teaching pro could decipher what needed, what came out of that information. And for the average player, most players can't figure out what racket to buy, much less how do I use this information and how much rotation did I get on the ball? Was it underspin? Was it top spin? Yeah, that, that I think is the hard part because it's just there's too much out there and it's mind boggling. Well, Dick, I wonder if any of these young guys know what yeah, rough and smooth is. Rough and smooth. Does anybody know what rough and smooth yeah, is? Yeah, we just spun the racket to see who served. They used to put a little trim. Smooth, yeah. <laughs> Very, it was like, looked like dental floss, really, in today's world. And you would you would just go go through here, sometimes up there, and we used to put it on because it looked good. But one half, one side of it would be smooth across the string. The other side, because that's where you looped it, was considered rough on the string. So that's how you, you spun the racket, rough or smooth. I thought the coolest racket I ever got, first of all, anybody ever heard of Harry, Harry C. Lee? Have you ever? The first new racket I ever got was a Harry C. Lee of New York. This is like 1958. And I didn't use it for a couple of years because it was brand new, I didn't want to ruin it. And then, literally about six or seven years ago, I was in Green, Texas, in one of those uh, antique shops, and I came across a Harry C. Lee racket, and I bought it. <laughs> 32 bucks. I thought, what am I doing? Am I out of my mind? But I bought it, so now I have one at home. But, uh, you know, those Wrighton Ditson and Harry C. Lee, stuff with Wrighton Ditson tennis balls, you never even hear about that kind of stuff anymore. And it's so dominant by just being dominated by a couple, uh, couple of names. And, uh, but it's throughout the years, you know, there, there, there have been a lot of different bats, but when I was, when I was a little kid, we, my brother and I used to sneak on the grass at the West Side Tennis Club during the U.S. Championships. And this one guy would come down from the sun deck, which was where the tournament, they ran the tournament from where they ran the tournament, and he'd kick us off and he'd go back up and we'd go over here. And he kept kicking us off and we just kept going on. And this happened to be the day of the finals. And, and uh, Neil Fraser from Australia was playing. A lot of you know Neil because he's been here in, in the past. And Harry Hopman, the coach, was there with him. And um, so the match was over, the ceremony was over. Everybody was leaving the stadium and we were still out there playing. And they happened to walk across the court where we were playing because they didn't want to go around where all the people were. And Harry, and Harry Hopman stopped and watched us hit some balls. And uh, he invited us up into the locker room to meet the players. Wow. And, and then he gave me a racket of a guy named Marty Mulligan. I remember that. Who is uh, Fila, basically he is Mr. Fila USA and was a Wimbledon finalist and a very, very good tennis player. And it was a Dunlop, no, it was a Slasinger. And a, forget the rough and smooth, this was so cool. On one side, it had printed your serve, and on my, the other oh, side, it had uh, my uh, serve. Uh, Here we go. Uh, uh, snour, snour there it is. Did, did that at the bottom. Sorry. It was so cool. I just, I, I just, this, this is too much. Oh, my serve, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> nobody else had any idea what the hell I was talking about, because nobody else had ever seen that in this country. So, cool racket. Did uh, dampeners come in? Exactly. John, do you know the answer to that? Yeah, I do. <laughs> it's always been one of the funniest stories I've ever heard. And you all remember back when Wilson came out with the profile racket. Prior to that racket, every racket that was a, a very thin beam was built around a foam core. So that's the center of the racket. They laid, they did the layups around the foam core. It goes into the uh, the mold. And it's heated and it's pressed, and that's what that's how the racket comes out. When the profile came out, it's built around a, a, an inflated bladder on the inside, so it's like a little inner tube, very thin uh, plastic tubing that's connected to an air hose. That pushes against the, the mold and it all becomes the racket. So when you would hit that racket, because it was hollow and very thick, it would ping. And it would be the difference between somebody hitting with a regular racket would sound like a wood driver on a golf club, and the the profile sounded like a more like a metal driver, so it was a really irritating sound for a tennis player for a tennis racket. Wilson came out with the vibration dampener to change the sound of that racket only. That's all it ever does. And I remember one of the guys from Wilson one day said, 
You know, there's no technology in vibration dampers. Otherwise, why would people be tying rubber bands around their strings? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's all it does. Yeah. <laughs> it does deaden the string bed, so you know, it depends on your feeling on vibration dampers. I personally don't like them because I want to feel the string bed. You're, I'm the same. I cannot play with one of those in my racket. I want to hear the sound. I like the sound. I want to hear the sound, and I'm used to the sound, and I know what it needs to be for me to feel comfortable. And when I don't hear the sound, um, doesn't happen much anymore. I like when I when it hits the center. I like to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Once a day, whether we need it or not, we get it. So. Historically, what's been the most uh, uh, productive racket, of, most sold racket historically? Do you know, my yeah. guess would be Jack Kramer. Kramer Wilson. Yeah. Born yeah. the Prince, the, the first Prince. I think Jack Kramer still outsold the Prince, uh, as far as I know, in, in per perpetuity. I mean, Prince sold a ton of the, the green ones, but still, and the Jack Kramer was still out at that time, so that was a long time. They came out with a Jack Kramer oversized wood racket once, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, that was a disaster, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I played a guy who was playing with it one time, and it was a guaranteed win because he couldn't hit a ball with it. But, really? <laughs> but the funny, the Jack Kramer, he, Jack used to brag about these golf courses he owned in, in Southern California. He said, the autograph racket bought me that golf course. <laughs> the autograph racket bought me that golf golf course. Uh -huh. You talk about making a fortune. Stan Smith on his tennis shoe and Jack Kramer with the Jack Kramer autograph. Sure. Wow. Hey, Doug, what about white balls? Because I remember playing with white balls when a yellow ball showed up. I said, what is this, a joke? It was very strange at, the, at first, yeah. but uh, you know, now it's hard to find it. You know, they do still make white tennis do they? balls. Yes, yeah. uh, mainly for the clubs that have uh, grass courts. I see. They still, they still use white balls. On the contrast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and Wimbledon was far and away much later than anybody else to, to go, to, go to a yellow tennis ball. Yeah. Right, Tony has a question, then we'll get Just Larry and everybody out of the stretch. ATP eliminates every racket but a wood racket. Who, who would be the best player? Rocket. I mean, today. Today. today, today today's today. tennis. Rocket. <laughs> Rocket. No, he, he, he's is he not here. I hope. He's, I mean, you know, people ask you all the time, and it's hard to compare era. Really, in any sport, athletes from one era to another. You know, they say, well, if these guys were playing today, could they, you know, how would they do? In my opinion. Rocket would be right up there, sure. fighting with Nadal and Federer as the number one player in the world. No doubt in my mind. That's how good this guy was. Even if he did hit me in the nuts one time. <laughs> it still, still hurts. hurts. Yeah. Who, who, I guess they're asking who benefits the most from modern day strings and rackets. Okay. Nadal obviously are yeah. the top players. Well, everybody learned the, learned the game. They learned it differently than we learned it. They learned it to, for today's equipment. So they're all using the, the benefits of Marty has been, something Marty to say. I'd like to reveal something. I have the drawings already ready to go, and somebody in my office.